And just as a matter of introductions, I'm Suzanne, and I'm joined by Heather Bustos and uh, Jody Nicoli. Jody will help us navigate the questions later, and Heather and I will be speaking. All right. Should we should we start already? Let's start, and then people can still join. So thank you so much for joining us today. I am thrilled that you are all here with us. And as I mentioned, my name is Suzanne. I'm the co-founder and a CEO of Citrus Labs. And I'm joined today by Heather Bustos, owner and oh. partner at Bustos Law Group. Uh, in terms of structure, so this webinar is all about product claims, how to create claims, examples of claims, um, and for brands to substantiate claims, clinical studies are generally a great way. Uh, this is why I will quickly talk about different options you have in regards to clinical studies, give you some examples of what some of our clients did with their results and claims. And then I will give the word to Heather, followed by hopefully an engaging a Q&A. And for the Q&A, please put your questions in the Q&A field um, here on Zoom. Or if you have trouble with that, uh, you can also put them in the chat. All right. So I hope you can all see my screen. Um, so to tell you a little bit more about Citrus Labs, Citrus Labs is a digital CRO, contract research organization with a specific focus on consumer brands. And our mission is to provide brands with affordable clinical trials to then uh, create research-backed product claims that drive business growth through website conversions, ad conversions, and retail listings. Now, many brand owners and executives are asking us, if clinical trials are actually worth the investment and what the ROI is. And one thing that almost all of our clients have in is that they experience significant growth in business after publishing a study with us. They saw, for example, increased website conversions, ad conversions. They have an easier time getting listed at retailers and they were able to create better marketing content. And Heather will talk about the marketing content and what you can do with it later. Now, as a CRO, a contract research organization, we provide clinical trials as a service, which means that you can outsource the entire study to us from start to finish. Uh, we take over the study design. We create the study materials, such as protocol, consent forms, questionnaires. Uh, we take care of participant recruitment, retention, compliance. We collect the data. We analyze the data and then write a neat clinical study report that also suggests uh, claims. And the types of studies we run varies a lot and differs a lot from customer to customer. And we are happy to help you find the right study design for your needs and the claims you'd like to make. And uh, to tell you a little bit more about the types of studies we run, I quickly give you an overview and some comparisons as well. Now let's start with the most common study type that we see, which would be a, a single group clinical study um, in which there's just one study group, the intervention group. There is no control group or placebo group. And this study type is fairly cost effective and a good way to show efficacy and create claims. A single group clinical trial, you can use many different methodologies to show that your product actually works. The easiest one is questionnaires. They can be validated or study specific questionnaires. And then you can also use biomarkers, for example, blood draws or stool markers for microbiome testing. You can use digital markers like uh, blood pressure, weight, uh, for skin products, you can also use uh, skin markers, measures through instrumentation, objective skin analysis, 
expert skin creating to measure hydration, um, the virtue of conditions like acne, fine lines, wrinkles, hyperpigmentation. And of course, uh, we can also do before and after photos. Um, and single crew clinical trials go through an IRB, an ethics committee, and can be put on clinical trials at God. Now, the less scientific cousin of a single crew clinical study is a consumer perception study. Consumer perception studies are also single group. They are questionnaire only studies and we typically see consumer perception in skincare. They are less scientific than clinical trials. However, they are a great cost-effective way to create marketing claims and they can also help you with business growth. And in perception studies, you typically don't use biomarkers but you can absolutely do before and afters, and you can also run skin analysis, for example. But we typically don't see consumer perception in supplements, for example. All right, so let's move over. There is the randomized control family, short RCT. Uh, you have all the advantages that we talked about during single group clinical trials, but RCTs are seen as the gold standard in clinical research because they give you a more unbiased view of if your product actually works. Um, here you find studies that have at least two study arms that are either placebo controlled or that have a control group, which is a group that doesn't take any intervention or placebo. And there are also RCTs with even three groups or more. Uh, typically in three groups, we have an intervention group, a placebo group, and then a control group. Now in the RCT family, you can also run a, a crossover study where you have again only one study group, but this one group goes through a control or placebo arm and the intervention arm. Um, but crossover studies uh, cannot be used by every brand. For example, skincare is typically a little bit trickier um, in a crossover design. Now, very important though, RCTs are more expensive than single group studies. Many brands don't need to run an RCT in order to show product efficacy and create claims. A single group clinical trial is still a clinical trial and it depends on your budget, it depends on your needs, which study type is actually right for you. And for example, a single group study that involves biomarkers, for example, can be superior to an RCT that only involves questionnaires. And now just to give you a couple of examples of actual claims that our clients are making um, and how they're using the study results. Uh, so I mentioned at the beginning that, um, you know, ad conversions, for example, this is a great example of uh, an Instagram ad uh, from our client a system, um, how they are using their claims. And then uh, next up is, this is what many of our clients do when they publish their results on their website, they use the science or clinical trials, for example, then this is an example of um, our client, Zemain. Uh, this is a crossover study with biomarkers. Here you see the HS, the CRP levels um, that they also published. Um, then next up is our client, Zemain. Uh, uh, their results from a single group clinical trial on their under eye concealer. Then we have Array. We tested their uh, bloating uh, supplement. Um, here we also involve before and after photos, even though it's not skincare, uh, before and afters. We're very fitting here additionally um, to the claims. Uh, then next up is Naked Poppy. This is uh, the result of a consumer perception study uh, for an under eye cream. This is what they did. Then next up is Super Gut. Uh, Super Gut did a gold standard randomized control study with three study arms, biomarkers that included uh, blood work, stool samples, we did waist circumference measurement, um, and also particip some participants were using a CGM, a constant glucose uh, monitor. This is what they've done with their study results. And then 
last but not least, I wanted to show you Common Air. Um, they were using also before and after photos that were clinically graded um, to showcase the efficacy of their retinol product. Now that is enough from my side. Um, I hope that you know, I give you a good overview about the different forms of clinical trials, how to showcase results. And now I give the word over to Heather to introduce Bristol's Law Group and tell you more about claims. And then we'll go into the Q&A. Thank you so much, Suzanne. Um, I'm so happy to be collaborating with Citrus Labs on this. Um, by way of introduction, as she said, I'm Heather Bustos. I'm the partner of Bustos Law Group. Uh, we're an FDA compliance firm, so we help companies in the food, supplement, cosmetic, OTC drug, and medical device spaces kind of navigate the FDA regulatory landscape. Um, so just to jump in right away, we're uh, going to be talking about creating product claims and from the perspective of an FDA compliance attorney. Um, so let's just jump right into the first slide. Uh, so why are claims important? Um, so as a brand owner, you're usually going to focus on this left side of the screen, the consumer perspective. That's usually where you want to be drawn to first uh, when it comes to marketing. Uh, you want those claims to build trust in your brand, boost your business growth, solve the customer's problems, uh, create your amazing marketing content. Um, what tends to be left out and not considered as often is the FDA's perspective. And it's obviously really important. Um, so uh, first of all, your claims can actually affect your product classification. So the category in which your product uh, sits can actually be modified based on the claims. Um, in addition, your claims will explain the product's intended use. So the FDA will try to figure out what is this product meant to do, and they'll be looking at your claims to figure that out. Um, it's also important to note that it applies to labeling, not just your packaging, your external packaging, but also your brochures, marketing materials, social media content, websites, all of that is considered an extension of labeling according to FDA, and uh, thus it's regulated by them. And so any claims, on any of those uh, types of materials are gonna be regulated as well. And then finally, substantiation, that is uh, Suzanne's realm, but it is important that you have um, studies, you have data to back up the claims that you're making. So these are all, like I said, important considerations from the FDA perspective. Really in a best case scenario, you're gonna have a harmony between these two. You're going to have the consumer perspective aligning really well with the FDA perspective. That's that's what I do. Um, again, if that FDA perspective is not considered, um, things like recalls, import alerts, warning letters. Uh, if you don't know what those are, I hope you never find out. Um, those are the things you never want to hear about as a business. And so um, that's that's like I said, the really important consideration. Um, so. Really, and if we jump to the next slide, um, we're going to be talking about, we're going to be doing some case studies on some companies who uh, essentially, these two sides were not in harmony, as I like to say. Um, so in these cases, there was a misalignment and these companies were able to realign. Um, I didn't want to leave you with a horror story. My goal was to provide some hero stories. Um, you know, a happy ending. Uh, so we're going to go into some claims in these three separate industries, the food supplement and cosmetic industries. So starting off with the first case study um, is in the cosmetics industry. So the FDA defines a cosmetic as something that is meant to beautify, to enhance the appearance. It's really meant to be something kind of superficial um, and so that, that definition is really important as we get into this uh, case study. So the first company I wanted to look at was Anne-Marie Gianni Skincare. They are a large cosmetics brand. They do a lot of all natural products. Um, Anne-Marie and her husband were uh, really big on YouTube and then started the skincare company. Um, and unfortunately they did receive a warning letter from the FDA and it was based on claims. Um, you know, they, they thought they were being, uh, they were making claims that were cosmetic claims. The FDA felt they were making drug claims. 
So here's some examples of some of the claims that FDA cited, and you can read through some of those. Um, really, we want to talk about how did the claims affect the FDA's perspective on the intended use of the product. So again, the FDA considered that product a drug uh, simply based on the claims, and uh, a drug is defined by the FDA as a product that is intended to mitigate, prevent, cure a disease or condition. So I separated this out into the disease or condition. Um, acne is considered a, a drug claim. Rosacea, you can see up at the top, um, hyperpigmentation. All of those are disease or condition claims. I also included lesser known, but also a little bit uh, tricky structure function claims. So any claims, especially in the cosmetic space, as I said, it, it needs to be kind of a superficial type claim. Structure function claims are uh, claims that uh, the ingredients in the product will affect the structure or function of the body. So in this case, boosts cell regeneration, builds collagen. Those are examples of structure function claims that they also made. Um, so on the next slide, uh, we're talking about how did they fix it, right? Here's the hero part of the story. So they modified their claims. Um, that's always uh, really a good way to handle these situations is to modify them, uh, delete, you know, what's maybe not important, kind of go back to the drawing, drawing board, revisit that definition of cosmetics that I, I alluded to in the beginning. Um, so here's an example of a prior claim, soothes and reduces redness and irritation. They then updated it to lessens the appearance of occasional redness. If anyone's seen a cosmetics commercial, you've heard uh, lessens the appearance of fine lines and wrinkles. What they're doing there is they're really strategizing on how do we make this a cosmetic claim. Um, so you'll see a lot of the appearance of, and if you're wondering, that's really what that comes from. Um, another one was hyperpigmentation that's considered a condition. And so they changed it to help with the appearance of an uneven skin tone. Um, and so really the reason why I wanted to share this story and why I think um, it's more of a hero story is because not only did they modify their claims, but they went a step, a step beyond that. They actually created a company-wide claim protocol, which I've been getting a lot of requests for this from clients because of the fact that we're using, you know, a lot of companies are starting to use influencers. They have sales teams that need to be on the same page when it comes to claims, what can be done. Um, their claim protocol is actually, you can Google it and it pulls up and um, it's wonderful because it gives uh, an outline of you know what FDA allows or doesn't allow. It's kind of a crash course in claims in the beginning. And then they have this huge index of all different drug claims and how you can modify them to cosmetic claims. To me, that that um, you know, like I said, they took a really holistic approach to uh, compliance. And obviously the FDA agreed with them and uh, because they issued what's called a closeout letter. So warning letters are, up, are made public. The FDA basically tells everyone on the internet, uh, you know, all the violations that you have and uh, the coveted thing that all these companies want is a closeout letter that the FDA is essentially, uh, again, on their website, publicly stating that all the violations that were listed are now resolved. And Anne-Marie Gianni, in a very rare situation, were able to uh, achieve that. And so obviously they satisfied FDA. And again, it's very rare in a claim situation to get a closeout letter. So for me, that's, that's really what makes them uh, the hero in this story. So jumping into the next um, category, the next case study uh, under the dietary supplement category. So uh, FDA defines dietary supplements as a product uh, that is taken by mouth or ingested and meant to supplement the diet. Um, so the, the company I wanted to look at here was Zarbi's Naturals. If you're not familiar with them, uh, they make these supplement syrups. They're aimed at children. And um, essentially, I think all of them are made with honey or uh, agave as the base. Um, and so Zarbi's, in their first iteration of the product, um, were issued a warning letter because of the claims they made. Um, again, not in harmony, right? They thought they were a supplement. The FDA thought they were a drug. So some of the claims that the FDA cited were uh, proven congestion relief, soothes sore throats, immune boosting. 
this fourth bullet may surprise you, but the FDA actually cited the fact that the company liked a review uh, made by a customer. So the customer in the review stated uh, colds and congestions were cleared up in two days. Another one said, uh, you know, this gave allergy relief to my husband. And because the company liked those comments, the FDA actually cited those as claims made by the company. So that's important to understand kind of the, the reach. This is a more recent uh, thing that you're seeing with FDA, but they will go after your reviews and, and all of that. So it's really important to have that under control. Um, so how did the claims affect the FDA's perspective on intended use? Um, again, I broke these out into the disease or conditions, uh, cold, congestion, allergies, sore throat. Those are all considered drug claims. And then uh, structure function claim is immune boosting. Um, so on the next slide, we'll talk about what did they do to fix it. So again, in again, what, what's the common way of, of responding to these warning letters? You usually don't want to argue with FDA very much. Uh, you want to try to just go back to the drawing board, especially if you, you know, are wrong. In this case, they were wrong uh, for trying to sell a supplement for cold and, and cough and congestion. Um, associated with colds. Uh, so they went back and modified their claims to meet the FDA's definition. Uh, here's an example of a prior claim, proven congestion relief, soothes sore throats, uh, and then the updated claim. And this is why I consider this a hero story. Um, generally speaking, the strategy for moving from that drug uh, space into the supplement space is to take your drug claims and try to craft them into supplement claims. And it's really hard to make a supplement claim when the purpose of your product is for colds and, and sore throats and coughs. So what they did was really clever. They essentially changed the claim to some benign conditions. Um, so it says soothe coughs associated with dry throat, coarseness and irritants. So in this case, um, they really went back to the drawing board with their legal team uh, and found a way to craft the claims. Um, a good rule of thumb with supplements is when you're crafting your claims, you wanna think about a claim that is uh, aimed at a healthy person trying to make them healthier versus an unhealthy person trying to make them healthier. So that's kind of the idea here is these are all conditions that a healthy person could have, you know, they're not associated with a disease or condition. So I thought it was really clever. Um, another example is immune boosting, and they changed it to supporting uh, the immune system. You'll see that a lot maintains the immune system, supports, those are all very common uh, in the supplement space. And um, again, this is a hero story because they were very clever. I actually had a client who uh, wanted to enter the U.S. market with a very similar product, a supplement that was made for coughs and colds. And that's how I even found out about the Zarbi story. And uh, we used a very similar strategy um, in that. So to me, that's that's where the, the hero part comes in. And they also were issued a closeout letter by FDA because they did such a great job. So the final uh, case study that I wanted to go into in the food space was Kind Bars. Um, if you haven't heard about Kind Bars, uh, they are essentially a health bar. They're made from uh, generally like nuts and fruit. Um, like I said, I, I would consider them a health bar, but the FDA disagreed. So they, in 2015, got a warning letter uh, where the claim healthy was uh, really the issue. Um, the FDA's perspective was that they did not meet the definition of healthy and thus they could not claim it on their bar. How in the world can Kind Bars not say that they're healthy? Uh, it makes no sense. And that's what Kind Bars, you know, essentially thought to themselves. And they took it a step further. Instead of just agreeing to remove the claim, they actually filed a citizen's petition to change the definition of healthy. Um, and the FDA actually allowed them to use the term. That was on a technicality at the time. They didn't change the definition but they acknowledged there was a need for changes. This was a 20 year old definition at the time. 
Now update to a couple of weeks ago when I was actually making this slide, um, the FDA finally released a proposed rule that will change the definition of healthy and it will now include products like Kind Bars. And something Kind argued in this case is, you know, you can say that a sugar-free pudding is healthy according to FDA guidelines, but a fresh piece of salmon wouldn't meet the definition because uh, the level of saturated fat would be too high. So all of this is, you know, we're, we're trying to update the agency uh, scientifically. Kind Bars has not stopped there. They're actually trying to change the way calories are counted as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, that standard uh, is from 1925. So definitely some updates needed, but this is definitely a hero story. Um, kind right now is all over the internet being heralded as a champion for industry because they're trying to change uh, the agency. The question is really how quickly can they do that? And obviously it took many years for this to change. Um, so these are, these are the case studies that I wanted to present. Uh, you know, I know you've heard a little bit about um, the warning letters and uh, what those look like. So we'll talk about some warning letter avoidance strategies. I don't wanna leave you with, uh, with nothing on, on that front because it's really important to think of this from a proactive standpoint. Um, if you're already making claims, that's fine. You can always go back to the drawing board and see how you can modify. Um, the goal is how do we uh, proactively avoid these situations? Because again, they're very costly. Um, so when it comes to product claims, here are some tips that I came up with um, just based on what I've seen uh, with clients and in the industries. Uh, so one is make sure you're reviewing the product category definitions. Um, I listed a couple of those. It's really important that you understand those definitions. Uh, two, understand FDA labeling definition. So again, that's not just your outer packaging. The FDA regulates any marketing materials that you put out, social media, websites, like you saw, likes on uh, reviews and comments. Those are all regulated as well. Um, number three, craft your claims to meet the definition. So make sure that you're keeping in mind that definition as you're making your claims. Um, it really is sometimes just wordsmithing and figuring out creative ways to kind of say what you want um, without crossing that line. Uh, four is ensure consistent messaging. Um, as I, I spoke about that protocol uh, with Anne Marie uh, Cosmetics, they uh, wanted to make sure that there was consistent messaging down the line, uh, including for influencers who are speaking on your behalf. It, uh, FDA actually issued a warning letter to Kim Kardashian not too long ago uh, as an influencer uh, because she was making claims on behalf of a, a drug company. So again, it's really important that that messaging is consistent because the FDA's reach is now extending. Um, they're coming out of the stone ages and understanding that they need to regulate the internet too and, and all of that comes with that. Um, number five is substantiate claims. Again, that's Suzanne's uh, realm, and uh, I'm not going to get into that in depth, but it's really important that you do have substantiation, you have things to back it up. Um, that's regulated as well by the FTC, making sure you have uh, studies. So those are some of the warning letter avoidance strategies. Um, to just close out, I, I genuinely appreciate everybody uh, being here. If you have any additional questions after the Q&A, um, anything about the content of the presentation, please reach out. I have a QR code here uh, that takes you to our website um, if you want to talk more. And then in addition, we have some of our handles for social media. We provide a lot of updates there um, in the regulatory space. So again, thank you so much uh, for having me and for listening to the presentation. Well, thank you so much, Heather. That was that was quite something. Uh, that was very informative. Thank you. What a story with Kind Bar. It is pun intended nuts <laughs> that they yeah. are actually not considered healthy. <laughs> and even like yeah. the story about the salmon, um, not considered healthy is um, so it's great that you know the FDA is now updating uh, their yeah. guidelines on that end. Years and years later, but yes, <laughs> it is a good thing. Yeah. So Let's go into questions. Jody, do you want to help us with that? Yes, of course. First question, how does the lack of 
or exclusion inclusion of a control group impact wording of claims? I think what Hella just said is that a lot of the time making claims is a lot about wordsmithing, right? Um, so I, I, Hella, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can't obviously when you have a uh, a study that involved a placebo, for example, um, then you can probably say, you know, this and that is significantly improved compared to, you know, placebo proof, for example. Um, but you can also probably make your standard claims like 96%, you know, experienced um, fewer period cramps, for example. Is that correct? Right. And, and I like to look at it as, um, as the FTC says, truthful and not misleading. So just always go back. That's like the North Star, in my opinion, is just, you know, stick to as truthful as you can be. Um, you know, fluff, I think, is allowed in certain cases, but then there's other cases where it can get you in trouble. So it's important to really uh, be thorough in reviewing those, uh, those claims before you make them. Absolutely. This question relates to Zarbies. Since they got in trouble for liking a comment, what could Zarbies have done on those comments that would cause issues? Would it be best not to interact with comments at all if they make unsubstantiated claims? That's a really good question. And, um, you know, yeah, there are a lot of clients that are just so shocked when I tell them even the fact that reviews are regulated because in their minds, like how how can I possibly control, you know, the reviews? Now, if these reviews are being made, you know, someone's putting it on their personal Instagram, that's a little different. It's out of your control. But when it's on your social media page, when it's on your website, even more so, um, you're in control of what goes up on that page. And so that's why the FDA puts that it, it's really your responsibility as the brand. Uh, when it comes to specifically the, the liking part, you really, again, it has to be something that is ingrained in your organization. Whoever's handling your social media has to understand where the lines are. Um, and so in that case, by liking it, what you're doing is you're giving the impression to the public and to other consumers that your product can do those things. That's really what uh, the way FDA sees it. And so the idea is you really have to be... Um, really uh, understanding of, like I said, what, where those lines are and then what kind of messaging is allowed or not. Um, and again, with social media, it's just getting harder and harder to control. So I understand that, but yes, the FDA has done that a couple of times, not just in Zarbi's case, but in other cases, I've had clients as well, um, you know, deal with that uh, extension of jurisdiction. So it, it is a good thing to think about, absolutely. And can I do like a, a follow up on that? So oftentimes what we are seeing is that um, some brands, they showcase reviews that, you know, customers gave them. For example, this moisturizer helped me with my eczema. So that yep. would be in the same category, right? Yes. Yeah. Eczema is, is considered a, a disease or condition. And so uh, if you're a cosmetic, for instance, you, you shouldn't be uh, claiming anything about eczema, not even using the terminology. You can kind of get around it, right? The wordsmithing is uh, the appearance of redness, right? Or dry skin. Those are kind of the things that we, we do when it comes to the wordsmithing. But um, yeah, when, whenever it's on a, a website, your own website that you control, that is your narrative. That's what you're putting out into the world. And so that's all FDA can go by to understand what the intended use is. And they're looking at it from a lay consumer perspective. What would that consumer think about your product by seeing this on your website? They're gonna think that you can treat my eczema. And then they're gonna forego the, the actual drug products that can, you know, are according to FDA are more effective in doing that or are made to do that because they're more heavily regulated. Okay. Um, when you work with Citrus Labs, will there be a legal review of any of the questions or claims coming out of the studies, or does that need to be conducted independently? So you can contact that independently, or you can work with Heather. Um, we do have a package uh, with Heather and Pusso's Law Group, 
and then you know based on if you if you're booking that package then you will have heather's and her team's review heather can i make claims based on published articles of the ingredients in our formula that's a really good question <laughs> okay so and and i have a client right now that um they're a supplement product and a lot of the time people don't understand uh, or you know it's it's difficult to understand kind of the way that claims are looked at when it comes to ingredients so i'm going to do like kind of an a plus b equals c so um fda in their mind if your product contains i don't know we'll say mint or we'll say lavender right uh and you're saying um it has antibacterial qualities. Antibacterial is a, is a drug claim. Um, FDA then says, if you're saying on your website that lavender has antibacterial qualities and your product contains lavender, then what you're trying to say is our product has antibacterial qualities. So they kind of make that connection. So it is important that um, when it comes to looking at ingredients, you still have to be careful with making claims. And I'll tell you a lot of the warning letters out there, that's exactly what FDA is talking about, where uh, the company said, all they simply said, and even if it's a well-known property of that ingredient, they're saying, you know, this ingredient does X, Y, Z, or it's been known for thousands of years that this product does X, Y, Z. Um, if you're putting that on your website and your product has that ingredient, then by association, you're saying that your product can do that. And that then becomes a claim. Uh, when it comes to studies, regardless of whether there are studies or not, if the claim is not allowed in that category of product, it's not allowed. So it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't matter how um, authoritative that study is. Uh, if the claim's not allowed, the claim's not allowed. Uh, plain and simple. So. Um, yeah, that's something definitely to consider uh, when you're looking at the claims for ingredients as well. We're getting lots of questions about reviews. Um, so should the posts or reviews be taken down? Do you recommend that? Or should the companies just not interact with them if the claims are false or aggressive? So one thing that I have uh, started doing, especially with the social media space, is we have, uh, what do we call it, like our site rules or our page rules, and we have disclaimers, and we have all of that. Uh, that can help somewhat to kind of show your intent as a brand, like we don't want to be considered, you know, a drug product, even, you know, it, even though we're a supplement, like we're, that's not our intention. If those claims are made, that's not, you know, that's not our problem. So if there's just comments that are made, um, you know, you do, it depends on how much caution you want to exercise. Um, you know, if you're coming from a really conservative perspective, you want to try to limit, um, you know, as many of the claims as possible. Maybe you want to come from a, an approach of what are the most, uh, you know, egregious claims. Like if someone says my product cures cancer, that's like an absolute no, no. But if they're saying, you know, more watered down things, maybe that's okay with you from a risk perspective. That's definitely something that I go over with my clients, depending on how much risk they're willing to take on and what their marketing goals are. Um, so when it comes to, like I said, reviews uh, from your own website, I would say definitely you have more control to review those, uh, make sure that they're in line with what you're trying to put out. And how can, our, how can FDA argue if everything that your company is putting out is not, uh, are not those claims and you're not intending that, how much better are you going to back up your argument if something comes at you from an enforcement standpoint um, when you say, look, everything, uh, all of our social media, our website, our packaging, none of it has any of these claims. Someone made one review. Someone went and posted on our, on our Facebook page a review. At the end of the day, that's going to give you a better argument. So I think that um, that's what I would look at when it comes to reviews um, on social media and website. Mm -hmm. I would think the FDA has limited monitoring capabilities. Is that correct? And if so, when and why does the FDA look at claims? That is correct. Um, I kind of see, you know, the agency is very underfunded um, for sure. 
uh, it's really kind of, I see it as uh, compliance is like an insurance policy. Uh, you may never use it, but you're glad you have it uh, when, you know, things go wrong. So um, really, uh, the FDA does have teams that sit and scour the internet. They'll have certain uh, projects where they're focusing on certain types of products. If you look at warning letters that come out, you'll see groups of warning letters that are all um, regarding the same topic or the same types of products. They recently did this with CBD, a bunch of CBD products. They came out with like seven or eight warning letters at the same time because that was their team focusing on that type of product. So that can happen. Um, it's important to note too, if you're importing, that's gonna add that extra level of scrutiny on you and you're gonna really need to have your stuff even more in line. But but again, at the end of the day, it's it's kind of like Russian roulette. You know, you, you, you may not ever get into trouble, but you may get into trouble the minute you release your stuff. It all depends on where FDA is setting their sites. So coming from a holistic perspective uh, when it comes to compliance is always, you know, I think it's a best practice and um, it's definitely a, a good way to run your company. It's gonna also give you a better brand at the end of the day. It's gonna give you a better reputation in, in your industry. So I think it, it definitely has benefits aside from just avoiding FDA enforcement and lawsuits for that matter. Suzanne. Being a small business with a limited budget, what study would you recommend for us to start with to help us justify these claims in the dietary supplement playground? I think in dietary supplement, um, I would probably go with a single group clinical study that has enough power to you know, basically give you statistical significance. And also if you have budget, um, you know, depending on what your product does, include also biomarkers. If you are a third party product rating platform, do the same FDA claim rules apply when describing products? A third party rating platform. So that means that you're posting about other brands products. So if you're the platform itself, um, there's a possibility that FDA reaches out to you uh, if you're the the brand owner of the, you know, of the product, not of the of the third party um, company. Then uh, I don't. For the most part, when it comes to claims, the FDA is generally not going to uh, comment on what third parties say. That's kind of out of your control, unless you have some kind of agreement or there's some kind of connection. Um, but for the most part, um, those types of platforms don't generally get, um, you know, issues with FDA. However, I'm just thinking of this now, uh, Amazon just got it's one of its first warning letters and they're a third party fulfillment. They don't, uh, make the products. They just fulfill the orders and they just got a warning letter, which, um, for anyone who's dealt with Amazon, you may be clapping or silently excited because Amazon, ha, you know, I, I call them like the mafia. They tend to just do what they want and they kick whoever out <laughs> that they want to kick out. So um, kind of seeing them take a little bit of responsibility, I, I don't know if it's a bad thing um, and it may get them in line. Um, hopefully that answered the question. Uh, but yeah, with the third parties, it's kind of a luck of the draw at this point because we've seen some movement there. What happens when you get a warning letter? Should you recall the product immediately and how much time do you get to rectify the claims? Do not recall the product immediately. <laughs> you, there are uh, many different strategies you can use to avoid recall. Um, usually, so when you get a warning letter, you have 15 business is to respond. It is uh, trying to beat the clock and FT is not looking necessarily for you to um, uh, fix every single problem in your initial response. What they want to see is a really well thought out plan of how you're going to execute um, all of the changes that need to be made. Um, when it comes to claims, for the most part, when I'm responding to warning letters for the majority of them, it's going to be, we're going to remove this, remove that. We're going to change this from this to that. 
Um, you know, also you have to come from the uh, holistic approach of we're going to train our employees as well internally as to what claims they can or can't make. So you're you're kind of putting together a plan in those initial 15 business days. You're trying to scratch off as many of the um, observations as possible. And then usually you're promising FDA certain updates um, by a certain period of time. So that's that's kind of how answering a warning letter uh, is done. And um, there are times where you won't really hear anything back from FDA. There are times where they'll kind of communicate back and forth. It just depends. Um, but really your goal, I think ultimately is the closeout letter, because again, when people Google search your business, that warning letter can come up. So, um, you really want that person who finds that warning letter to find the attached closeout letter to show that, okay, there's nothing really going on here. Um, there's no issue that's currently going on. To meet FTC standards, do I need more than one study to substantiate claims? Is that a Suzanne question or a Heather question? I think it's a Heather question. <laughs> I think it depends. I think it depends, right? It depends on um, what you're trying to say. I mean, the more substantiation you can have, the better. There are cases where I believe you can use other studies. It's not as authoritative, and it depends on the claims you're trying to make. I know that's a lawyer answer, it depends, but um, it really does depend on the claims you're trying to make, uh, will determine what kind of studies you should or shouldn't have, or what are gonna be more authoritative. Um, from the FD, FTC perspective, they give very vague guidance as to what kinds of studies and substantiation, um, but I think the more you can provide, the better. You can um, you know, look up studies online um, that have been done on, let's say, a certain ingredient. I had a client who included green tea extract, and, you know, we were trying to find studies that support the weight loss uh, claims. So, I mean, there are different ways to do it. Um, it all depends on the claims that you're trying to make and what you need to support those. Yeah, exactly. And I think most, most of our clients per product, they are doing one study, and then, you know, they are making claims on the product based on that one study, and then they move on to typically their next product to substantiate claims for the next product as well. This question comes from somebody that's at a silk sleep mask company. If we use non-drug claims to avoid being put in the drug category, for example, to help you enjoy a more peaceful sleep, but then we have clinical trial results that say 90% of people slept better does this mean that the FDA would still classify us in the drug space? That's, that's a really difficult question to answer without um, getting more information because that may also be in the device space. There's, there's a couple of things I'm thinking, but um, I think that that is a very specific question that may be better suited for um, like a private conversation, like a consult um, where I can kind of go through uh, a little more in detail what the product is, what kind of marketing you wanna make, and then, um, yeah, or what kind of marketing uh, you want to put out. And then we can discuss, you know, what kind of claims and what kind of substantiation is needed. Do closeout letters need to be pursued with the FDA to get them to be issued, or will they automatically follow up on a warning or violation letter after a period of time? Closeout letters take a really long time uh, coming from FDA, and a lot of the time don't come at all, um, especially when it comes to claims. I, I have a client currently that we've requested a closeout letter from FDA, but because it's uh, claims, uh, related and the fact that you can kind of change claims, you know, within a minute, right? You can change your website today to have no claims and you could change it tomorrow to be full of claims. So the reason why those closeout letters are difficult to get is because of the, just the nature of claims themselves. Um, I usually try to pursue them if I feel that we've done everything that we needed to do to, to close it out. 
The question is whether the agency will issue it. That's a little more up in the air. And there have been a lot of articles on how poorly FDA is doing in that respect on issuing closeout letters and how long it takes to get them. So that's why I really wanted to stress like the, the rare situations where that um, has come about. And I wanna say in those two case studies, they came a long time after. It wasn't like an immediate thing. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's not as common as you might think. Suzanne, what are the costs associated with clinical trials? <laughs> that is a question that is almost impossible to answer without knowing <laughs> anything about uh, the product. Um, so as I mentioned before, they are many different forms of clinical trials. Um, there's even the option, the possibility to have a consumer perception study. Then you have single group clinical studies. Then additionally to these single group clinical studies, you can add on biomarkers, you can add on like blood draws, stool samples, you can do digital markers, um, you know, different tracking things um, of, uh, of your vitals, of your sleep, uh, you can also have for skincare, right? You can have different forms of skin analysis, um, different form of instrumentation. And then you also have the option of an RCT. So to answer that question, how much uh, this will be, I would need to know more about your product. And uh, if you want to get a group from us, uh, you can just go on our website, um, you know, citruslabs.com and then contact us. And then one of our team members will get back to you. Heather, if your product is gluten-free, is it okay to claim that it is safe for people with celiac? If it's a food or supplement. Um, so first of all, gluten-free is a regulated term. It's important to, to understand what the requirements are to call yourself gluten-free. FDA has a guidance on that. Um, I think if you mention uh, celiac, well, I have seen people put like celiac, uh, I think it's a celiac association approval on their packaging. That's a good question. I haven't had that question before, but it's definitely something that I can discuss, you know, in a console or see, um, you know, what else, uh, whether that's something that can be done or not. It's a good question. <clears throat> Did the companies who made structure function claims, not disease claims, not have data to support biological health benefits? So structure function claims come into play um, and what, what makes them important is, so for example, in the supplement space, you are allowed to make structure function claims. An example of this is calcium builds strong bones. So uh, building strong bones, it affects the, the structure of the body. Um, so you're saying that an ingredient in your product affects the structure function that is allowed in the supplement space, um, not in other spaces. Um, and it really has to meet the definition well. So uh, that's a really tricky area. Um, but with um, with structure function claims, really the, the data that you need to support it is gonna be the same for, for any other claim. Um, you do need to have substantiation of any claim that you're making, whether it's a structure function on a supplement or, or not. If a customer left a review on our website stating this facial oil helped calm down my eczema, what would you recommend we do? Take it down or reply? There are different strategies that you could use. I mean, taking it down might be one. Uh, yeah, I, I would probably try to stay away from it. But um, again, it depends on how much risk you're willing to take on, how conservative you are. Um, there's a couple things I would need to talk about. The question is, if your product is really meant for eczema, is it better served in an OTC drug category? I mean, there's a lot of considerations when it comes to claims. And there are times where you know, again, if your product is, if every person using your product says, this helped my, uh, and that's really what you're trying to do, then let's, let's get you into the OTC category. So you can say the claims that you want, so you can market it the way that you want, so you can plan uh, the, the type of funding you'll need and the strategy. Um, so it just kind of depends. There's a lot of um, different considerations, but uh, 
if I were to give you an answer right now, I mean, removal is, is probably the most conservative way to handle it, I would say. And I think given time, we have time for one more question. Okay. Um, Choose wisely, Jody. Choose wisely. <laughs> the pressure, no pressure. Is on. pressure is on. Yeah. <laughs> um, how do we go about a claim for an ingredient generally known as safe with known properties and claims like soothing lavender? Is there no way to say something about an ingredient, ingredient known claims? Uh, if it says soothing, soothing isn't really going to be a drug claim. Um, it's probably a, a recommendation I would make to modify a claim to, to say soothing, for instance. Um, yeah, again, it, it would depend. These are kind of specific questions, but, um, with ingredient specific claims, again, if it, if it is a claim that is not allowed in that category, whether it's well known or not, um, you really shouldn't be making it, or you should change the category, and that's that's the issue, right? It's it's such a stark difference between a supplement and a drug, and then even in the drug category, there's the new drugs, which are clinical trials, and you know all of that, or there's OTC, which has to fit in this little perfect box. Um, so it's kind of difficult to say, but that would definitely be a strategy. Um, question as to whether you want to stay in that category, depending on what kind of claims you want to make. I, I really like to look at it from a holistic perspective and kind of back up, see what your goals are. What are your marketing goals? Who are you marketing to, you know, and what are you okay with? Um, and then that's how I make the determination on claims. So um, I think there's like some steps before getting to just talking about the claim itself. Thank you, Heather. Sure. Great. And then thank you so much, everybody, for participating in this very engaging uh, Q&A. And thank you so much, you know, Heather, for participating as well and, um, you know, helping us and um, showing um, us what we can and can't do in terms of claims. Uh, that was very informative. And if you want to, you know, talk more to Heather, you can find her at uh, www. Uh, bustoslawgroup.com and you can scan the uh, QR code and uh, if you're interested in talking to us about your studies you can find us at uh, citruslabs.com or send us an email at hello at citruslabs.com and yeah thank you so much for your time everybody and I hope you have a great rest of your day bye bye